Welcome Internet, the psychologist casual review, and today I wanted to review Reverie and Interpretation by Thomas Ogden, uh, with the subtitle Sensing Something Human. So it's a book that I found very, very interesting in reading it, because it's a very, I felt, genuine book on psychoanalysis and how modern psychoanalysis can truly be and what it should truly be. Because Ogden has the, this whole idea that basically uh, what we create as therapists, so what we experience with our patients, be it uh, daydreaming, some songs that come back to mind, certain images, etc., etc., the reverie part of it, to quote Bayern and to make it a little, to sparkle a French touch, because it's also in French, reverie. So basically, it's the idea that basically what comes through to the therapist is very important to the patient. One could think that it is counter-transference, and it's part of it, but it's not just that. It's also being able to use all of those things that seem completely unrelated to be able to select or understand the whole of the transference, counter-transference, dynamic with the patient and I found that this was incredibly interesting as it is I think something very hard for us therapists to really be able to take a step back and look at what we're feeling within at the time of the patient and not just what we're feeling within but what we're thinking about because often we might as therapists think oh I, I have to focus I have to think about what's happening right here, right now with a patient. I can't, I can't have anything come into my mind. But he's saying, no, 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 you should let those things occur because there are important elements in the intersubjectivity. Because for him, those elements that the psychotherapist holds and develops is not independent, it's with the patient. As Even though we might not know, it creates what he calls the analytic third, meaning the reverie of the clinician is going to encounter the reverie of the patient and both are going to create a third space, an analytic third, in which what is human is going to be able to be sensed. And this is why he named it that, I suppose. And basically that humanness that's going to come from the, um, from the relationships, from the dynamic, is what's going to be able to make people, analysands and people who come through therapy, being able to grasp something again of their humanity, of their lost sometimes humanity. And when he means humanity, he means what we are truly, because sometimes because of trauma, because of PTSD, because of psychosis, because of a whole range of elements, our feeling of humanness is going to be lost or impeded. And Ogden, through this form of therapy, through this form of reverie, it's a way of reconnecting with the patient and with the whole of humanity as a whole, and for the patient to reconnect with what makes him fundamentally human through the therapist as a bond to this humanity. And he also states, basically, and that's what I found very interesting, that there is in the, during the sessions, there is what he calls aliveness, in which sins become alive and you really feel the genuineness, both of the patient and of the therapist, and both are genuinely communicating. And what he calls the deadness, the um, sins are not communicating, the interpretations are canned, as Ogden says in his book, meaning that the interpretations are not good, they feel a bit cliched or, or forced to be put on a situation that do not really stick the land in. And that's very interesting because that's something that can often happen, that you're not... You know that the, the interpretation is not necessarily 100% accurate, but you're still going to say it, but you still feel that it's not 100%, and the patient also feels it. So it's very interesting. And what I found pas very passionate about the book is that he makes a whole effort to share... He Ogden's, his own reverie, like he talks about movies he's seen when he's with patients, that how they come up and how you can use those reveries to understand something, 
and how basically throughout the whole course of therapies, and he's very generous, like he gives dozens and dozens of examples, or maybe not dozens and dozens, but he gives quite a lot. And he often explains how interconnected all of these sins are, that his reverie is basically something that the patient is also experiencing, or that gives him a sensation on an unconscious level, and something on an unconscious level that's going to be able to be transformed and given back to the patient in a much more conscious, but also unconscious, because that's how it works, way. And I found that this was very interesting, especially his concept of aliveness during the sessions and deafness, where basically deafness is the pu pushing back against the... Um, the therapy against the healing, against the genuine relationship, and aliveness is that connection, that deep and profound connection both to the therapist and to the whole of mankind. And that's something I found very, very interesting. He also talks about the perverse um, analytic situation, which was very interesting. For him, the problem of the perverse situation, which, to be clear, I don't think he means the pervert, as we say in psychoanalysis, in a structural way, meaning just people who have a sexual perversions, but he means people that are so far removed from humanity and from their core self that they are going to twist and bend the, the relationship and the reverie, often preventing it altogether. Basically, he explains that for people who are like that in a perverse situation, they're going to create a moment where genuine connection is going to be replaced by intellectual excitement. And that excitement is not genuine. It's there to replace the genuineness, to kill it in a way, and to fit it with something else, something that's dead, dead and alive, like a hybrid, a strange hybrid. But it's not aliveness, it's deadness with an intellectual skin as one would say. And he says that this is because because a per, pervert and perverse situation is so basically intertwined with the fact that they don't believe in love, they don't believe in kindness, they don't believe in anything. Basically, they feel that that, when it exists within others, is something to be destroyed, something to be feared. He's going to explain how basically they don't believe in the primitive scene, I hope it's like that you say it in English. It's basically the idea of the two parents having a relationship and that relationship creates the child. Basically, that's it, if you don't know what it means. And that, that love, that fundamental bonding of the two parents, it's something that the perverse situation does not allow because it's twisted. And in its twistedness, it's going to devitalize everything, to take out life from everything because... The perverse person does not believe in any of that. He only believes in the fundamentals of excitement and destruction. So that I found was very interesting and very true, clinically speaking, that there is a devitalization aspect in it. But to come back to the core of the book, which is the aliveness and how to use reverie, I must admit, as a therapist, it's kind of hard to do it as Ogden presents it. But it's very interesting nonetheless, and it's something I think that needs to be kept in mind. And there's something else that I wanted to touch upon, because it's kind of unique. I've only seen it in this book, so I wanted to really talk about it. It's the poetry. Ogden is very interested in poetry. He likes it a lot, and he talks about it. He's even been called uh, the psychoanalytic poet, which is a, a sweet and nice title, I feel. And basically, he ends his book um, on the analysis of some Frost poems. So, Robert Frost, the famous American uh, poet. So, I'm no expert on poetry, right? But I found them to be very interesting, especially because he gives his sense of the poem. And not in a dogmatic way of, like, this is how you do it, but more like, this is what you can hear. And he encourages people to basically uh, read the poems aloud and repeat them a couple of times in order to really feel, not just like understand, but feel the, the poem, feel even what it feels like within one's mouth, how the vibrations work, how everything works, and more, much more holistic. And he says that basically, even though he did not write this to be useful psychoanalytically, I felt that it was a 
beautiful passage and a brilliant um, ending to the book because basically he leaves us with the idea that psychoanalysis and poetry uh, go hand in hand with the analysis of the Frost poems, which basically are very interesting. The, the idea of the one, the burial at, at home, the, um, the one about time, and the one about the tent, all of them show both the fragility and incredibleness in human existence. And I think that's at least what I took out of it. My reverie about it was that it shows us how brilliant and beautiful, but ever so fragile, humanity we possess. And that humanity is something that we can all grow together and we should grow together. And that basically, it's something that we therapists try to grow within our patients. But it's also something that our patients grow within us also, because it works both ways. And he does state that. And I found that incredible. And I really, really liked it. So it's a very hard, like, approval. Like, I think he was brilliant in this book. And basically, um, it's very accessible. Like, I mean, he doesn't use too many technical terms. And he's very, very explicit when he thinks about ideas. So on the whole, I would really recommend. So I hope you liked the review. And if you have anything you'd like to ask, please feel free to do so in the comments. Bye.